perfect. Ah, all I did hey. was start up again. Okay. Hi. All right, you've got it. I get really impressed by this. Are you ready? This is our intro. Ready, steady. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah, that's cool. Ta da! Ta da! We are, hi! Hi! Mild technical problems. We are live, and I can hear you, and you don't sound like an alien. Welcome. Thanks, Finally. Dave. Nice to have coffee with you again. <laughs> yeah, neither of us drinking coffee. I was saying on a different date that when I set up the coffee dates originally in real life, we got to go out to a coffee shop and have coffee. And then when I started taking them online, a lot of people much prefer doing it in the afternoon. So I made the schedule like afternoon time. So I have my water with cranberries and lemon, whatever. Well, I have <laughs> mine drinking? with water with lemongrass from the garden and mm. um, and lemon and mint Very from nice. the garden. Yeah. Delish. Yeah. So Devorah Kerr, will you introduce yourself to anyone who will be watching this? Wow. <laughs> I thought you were going to me. <laughs> um, You'll get it right. Okay. So after a long journey, um, I would love to say that I feel I am a healer. I work with people in the realms of their minds, their bodies, and their, their neshama, their soul. And um, it's very hard to separate the three. So I started off first as a reflexologist, but that was just all about the body. And uh, what frustrated me there was uh, that I couldn't uh, help people with their dying questions of why do I have to be sick or why can't mm. I have a baby? So um, that, that just showed me how limited it is when you just work on, on only the body. So I went to study then logotherapy and um, that helps us get to the, the real person, what's really happening. And then we can also try and change the why questions into what now. And I think that's very beautiful. And then more studying <laughs> has uh, um, um, gotten me to studying somatic experience, which is emotional aid, which works on the level of the nervous system, as well as mental imagery for healing, which is using our minds to help us heal. So it's using the imagination. Um, because that trauma and difficulty challenge and especially things, unfinished things from the past get stored in the nervous system. So when we can work on the, that level of clearing things out the nervous system, it like frees up like a ripple effect um, for things to be open and allowing for today. So and this is why it's better that you did the intro than me. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure I would have remembered all of that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we went backwards and forwards with the title. And we settled on this ask what now instead of asking why me yeah so i think that's, that's a huge thing yeah yeah it's a huge thing because um even in my own life every time we ask the question what now uh, at least why me it's a, a it's a victim question it's why is this happening to me and that doesn't give us too many options it's that this has happened upon me Right. Um, but from my experience and um, my studying and working with people, I've come to notice that if you ask different questions, um, you'll be able to move somewhere with it instead of being stuck. So when we ask what now, and actually um, in Hebrew and in French, this is a beautiful, beautiful um, idea, because in Hebrew the word lama is um, why. And the yeah, same in French is um, pour, it's either pour quoi or pour quoi is, is why. And um, if you change the vowels on lama to lama, it's just a mm -hmm. small little change you get for what? For what purpose? For what? And yeah. then the same in French, if you change the pour quoi to pour que, it's just like you separate it into ah. two words instead of one. It's like the same that. thing. So Very it is good. what it is asking of us is a small change, a change in mindset and outlook. That not just asking um, why me, because why me keeps us stuck. Like why do I have to be stuck in traffic again? Why do I have to be sick? Why can't I have the job I want? Why can't I have the baby, the husband, the fill in the blank, whatever that you want? And um, when we're in that space, we are so stuck. 
But if we were to mm. ask ourselves a different question, because we are often, often, as we can see from coronavirus and lockdown, all of that, we can't determine the circumstances of our lives. And they're right. happening anyway. You can't stop the rain coming on your wedding day. But you right. can decide, you can decide what to do because the rain is coming. And yeah. so that's what now the what now and the for what reason has this come into my life that i love to work from that deeper space that this is in my life i can't i can't get rid right, of and it that's yeah that's the thing because we've worked on this together i think i've taken possibly every range of treatments that you have to offer um <laughs> there may still be something i haven't tried yet but we've definitely mm -hmm. worked on that and i know for me i noticed how hard that was for me just to get to that first stage of saying this has happened, what now? Like, I couldn't get to that what now because I was so stuck and so angry yeah. about the this has happened part. And I spent right. a lot of time in that space working on that, right. being able to accept that this has happened or this is happening. I was still yes. stuck on, but why? I don't want it to be happening. I want it, I want a different reality. And I think, right. you know, I'm someone with quite a vivid imagination. I know I would like mm -hmm. imagine these alternative realities and spend my time in my head over there in this alternative universe. Right, right. And actually the imagery is, is a good thing to do. It is a good thing to do to imagine um, what things could be like because that can propel you to then move from where you are. And it's okay to have this fit about, I don't like what's happening. It's always mm. important to recognize i think many many years ago and i am a very positive person but many years ago i was like just put a smile on your face and everything's going to be all right but what i've come to learn now is that you need to be in the pain of this didn't work out the way i mm. wanted it to be let me just mm -hmm. mourn that and let me give myself right. some so love and kindness exactly around it. that that's and it. then i can yeah. maybe move on and that's what and you did for me is you made space for that. And I never understood the phrase. Yeah. There's a lot of phrases that I never understood. And I, it's not that I dismissed them. I just struggled with them. And I sought to learn what people meant by it. You know, right. when people would say, choose better language, ask better questions. Well, which questions? <laughs> what question is a better right. question? And when you talk about um, suffering, giving yourself the permission to be in that suffering for like not forever the but permission. to give it the respect right. that, that it deserves and give it the time and then right. know what to do next actually because a beautiful um way the nervous system works now that i've learned through somatic experience is that when we notice what's going on on a sensation level in the body. So let's say you're suffering with something and it feels like um, a pain in your, in your say, in your solar plexus, right? And if you actually mm. just go there and be with it, it's an able to, and work with it from that space, it's able to discharge. But if you well, say, no, yeah. I'll put a smile on yeah. my face, then it's ignoring it. It's like mm -hmm. the dog who wants the bone to be thrown or the ball to be thrown. It's going to nag you until you throw it. So we have right. to acknowledge this is how I'm feeling and be kind to ourselves from that place. Yeah, and I think it's a really bad message and I'm not sure how we all adopted it. This old stiff upper lips, just plaster a smile on your face, the show must go on, is so right. toxic and it's so right. unhelpful. And it's something that I internalize and I'm not special. I'm sure plenty of people um, yeah. internalized it just the same as I did. And it was it was groundbreaking coming to the realization that you don't have to, it's okay not to be okay. You don't have to pretend. Right, you don't have to pretend everything's okay. And um, the other thing that logotherapy does, which is very beautiful, is we look at other times when someone might have felt the opposite or different or how did you get through a challenge before we look at mm. like what you have within you already that you can apply now because this is the nature of life like from the first child time a child starts to teeth there is pain this is the nature right. of how life is no one lives in wherever mauritius and uh, right. we all have pain. We all have, as nice as that would be, even in there, they're in lockdown. No, I was going to say, I'm nice, sure people live in Mauritius. But <laughs> as, nice, as nice as it would be to have a life that's just plain sailing like this, even on the heart machine, that doesn't look good. You know, no one wants a life with yeah, a flat line. I don't want to be flatlined. Yeah, we don't want to be flatlined. So it is about looking at the challenges and the difficulties that you might have had in your past. 
How did you get through them? If we look back at those mm. challenges, what did you learn about yourself through them? There's, yeah. um, there's, there's a wonderful idea that um, Rabbi Tetz actually speaks about. And he says that um, if you don't go through a, a difficulty or a challenge, right, when you're forced into it, you're in the hot seat, right, that that which is in you, which has just been lying dormant up until this time, is able to come out. And you yeah. might have greatness coming out or strength coming out or courage. And someone will say to you, where did that come from? Is that, I don't know. But it's the actual yeah. challenge that lets you feel who you really are. Right, so, you have well, this, this secret yeah. toolbox that you haven't opened yet. Right, that it could just be waiting there dormant. So if the challenges don't come, we actually don't know what we're made of. So mm. I always quote this um, this anonymous quote. My daughter has it, Danny has it in her bedroom, which says, I didn't know how strong I was until being strong was my only option. Mm. Yes. Indeed. So it's a different way of looking at struggle and challenge. Like, okay, this is hard. This sucks. What can I do about it? Not mm. why me? You know, it's like two different parts. Yeah. We can or, take. or when we haven't been very used to, to, like a friend will give you a problem and they'll say, let's think of something that actually really does suck. Okay, my husband lost his job. Oh, yeah. never mind. I'm sure he's greatly intelligent. I'm sure he'll find something new. Such yeah. an annoyance. Or my boyfriend just broke up with me. Plenty more fish in the sea. Right. You know, like for every, you know, we just moved house and I'm so stressed and there's boxes everywhere. Oh, they'll be unpacked before you know it. All of these comments yeah. that people make, <laughs> that we all make, throwaway yeah. comments that we haven't taken the time to think about. If someone was saying that to me, how helpful would I find it? The answer right. is obviously zero. It's just, yeah. you just want to smile and say, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> and the yeah. most helpful thing you can do is, you know, sit with your a friend and say, oh, that sucks. And not start talking about when you moved house or when your husband lost his job, but just to exactly. actually just acknowledge that it really sucks. Yeah. We, we yeah. have this urge to fix everything. So, and then so the same the same thing applies to how we treat ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. like to actually give ourselves a space and say, wow, I really am angry or wow, this really is challenging and to mm -hmm. be in that space because that, from acknowledging that, that helps us to open the door to the what now. How can I show up now for this? Right, and I think once you get into the habit of doing this, I don't think you look back. I haven't looked back yet. <laughs> yeah cool <laughs> you idea. know it just it, it it changes your perspective um i'm yeah. quite confident to say that you know this is the way that i think now yeah well there is this whole concept of like um would you like to be your own best friend <laughs> you know and actually i heard um dr edith eager gave a um an hour and a half interview 92 oh, really? years old um i heard the other night was outstanding. And you know what? She asked this amazing question. She said, would you like to be married to yourself? <laughs> I think and I'm I just great. Love that. <laughs> I think I'd be really good life. Well, partner. I just love that question because, because <laughs> we're always looking outside there at what the other person can do to improve. But mm. being, being married to ourselves is going to have some challenges. And I think yeah. it's an opportunity, like a, an invitation to what would that mean? Or being your own best friend, would you like it? You know, like we sit with stuff and we say, oh, whatever. If, if you, I mean, at the moment I'm busy writing this massive project for um, logotherapy, the final level, it's going to become a book in the end, which is very exciting. Ooh. And there's sometimes when a voice will come and say, like, who do you think you are writing a book? Who do you think you are? Absolutely. Now, I think it's now, like the most niggling voice. Like, would you hang out with a best friend who spoke that way to you? Like, you'd like, this isn't someone I want to spend time with. So, like, why are we doing that to ourselves? Mm. Right? So, I love that question when she asked it. Because um, the way we want to experience people is how we need to be towards ourselves as well. Yes. And I had a discussion with a friend about this because that quote of love your neighbor as yourself Mm -hmm. is so much deeper than it was ever understood to be because the whole point of it is until you love yourself there's not any love to go around for any true love to go around for other people if you're the kind of person that really 
you know, struggles with self-esteem and self-worth and love, truly loving yourself, then the way that you love other people, it's going to mirror that and it's always going to be inadequate. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you don't agree 100%. Go on. No, I think we have to start with ourselves because like, we are the soil in which we plant our stuff. You know, we right. have to start. We want we want to flourish. We want to grow. We want to develop. We want to be the best that we can be. But if the soil isn't good and we're not watering it correctly and we're not giving enough sunshine inwards, nothing's going to grow from that. And mm -hmm. uh, then, then we wonder why we show up for others as mediocre. You know, it's because we aren't coming from that space of I'm doing good here. This space is like taken care of and now I can give mm. to others. Like I always say, you can't pour from an empty pot. Um, right. And I think you can't put like you can't pour from one domain into the other as well. If you haven't sorted out all this stuff in your private, then running a business, you're going to mm. really, really struggle with it. Because if you haven't sorted your head out. Yeah. Then then how are you supposed to be able to manage something that like responsibility like a business? Right. Right. So if someone came to you and they were asking you uh you know the why me questions mm. I, i'm assuming that it's not always going to sound like why me like it you know how do those questions appear what kind of questions are people asking things are like i can't cope and um, this is too much for me i feel like i'm being pushed too far too much um i don't have mm -hmm. it in me um, and there is a lot of um, why, why does this always happen to me? Um, right. These are the kind, kind of questions that, uh, that people are struggling with. Um, recently, I had, I had someone who I worked with who, um, who had this big why me question of like she, she was born into a family where, um, you know, all the siblings were around, where her and all her siblings were born, home births, these magnificent experiences of mother nature. And now as she's preparing to give birth, she finds out that there's going to be a C-section. And there mm. was this huge why me. You know, I had this plan of how my life was going and now it sucks. Right. And um, we we worked from that place because it doesn't help to be in that place of I want a natural birth when that's not your option anymore. So to go right. into the place so of finding the resources of how can you show up to this new information what can you do right. to to welcome this baby into your life? And it was beautiful. We actually did also imagery work with her to to go to that place of um, surrender. To this is just the, the actual birth where she came to was a magnificent space of the actual way the baby comes out is such a teeny space on the timeline of the life that that yeah. she'll have with this child that. Why and the way that the so baby much comes out in a C-section, if you've ever watched videos of it, it's a miracle. Yeah, so that it's wouldn't have helped level, but to tell her no, that. Of that's course, not I would never help. say that. But like, as you're saying it, I'm thinking, wow, like it's actually, yeah. it, it's actually like miraculous in, in itself. And if you can get by yourself, not with someone else telling you, but if you can get to that place of saying, oh my gosh, this is also a miracle. Right. right, that's what's so, so hard to what's... say when you're mourning, you can't yes. see that something else is also wonderful. You just can't. Yes. So it was Until about like tomorrow, this obviously. door. <laughs> <laughs> this door, <laughs> this door is closed for me right now. And there right. is time to just grieve about that. But there's so many others that could be open through this. You know, right. like this in her case, the baby is coming. Are you gonna like saddle up and get ready for it and be excited and what can we do from that space of welcoming this baby you know and and that was very healing for her very very healing mm -hmm. yeah i remember yeah. i did imagery with you and i'm perfectly happy to share it on facebook and an open book um we were working around and i've talked about this quite a lot we were working around my in a dialogue that would always assume that people wouldn't like me um, mm. and that new people meeting me would not want to become my friends. Um, we talked about a lot of things, but then we went and did this super powerful scenario where 
I went back to think about a time that was so painful for me where I was being bullied and, um, you know, two, two girls, or one of them was supposed to be my friend who then turned around and said, I'm not your friend anymore. I'm so-and-so's friend and you can't hang around with us and don't talk to us kind of thing. And we basically, you had me think about someone who was my friend at that point, because in my head, it's like, I didn't have friends. I didn't have friends. At 11 years old, they didn't have any. Of course, it mm -hmm. wasn't true. Again, like you can't, when you're in that painful place, you can't quite see straight and your brain convinces you that you're right. I was so convinced that I was right. And you made yeah. me think about, you know, a friend that I'd had my whole life who has always, always been there for me. And she's always been just incredible. We've never, ever fallen out with your friends since we were tiny. And we've never once felt fallen out. So you had me invite her onto the train where the bullying was happening on the train on the way to school. We invite my friend onto the train and then we had to imagine what would happen next. And it was so powerful. It was insane. I mean, I can even so like, actually think about it. What's happening there is, um, and actually it wasn't what I said to you, imagine a friend. I offered you what would have helped at the time. So what we're doing is we're empowering mm. the person to be in their own nervous system to see my needs weren't met. It was so painful what would have helped me? And then you said, well, and I've got I this said, amazing okay. friend who you brought in. So when oh. we do this kind of work, we always respect the other person. It's not like I would say, well, just picture your mom there giving you a big fat hug and everything's going to be fine. Okay. Because right. that's not what you, what you needed was the courage of and the, the, um, the, the love of the friendship to give you the confidence to know this other friendship isn't worth it. So what really unfolded there was that your nervous system, through seeing this new imagery, experienced a bit of a healing. Mm, and then it could absolutely. close that it could close that book. Because this is what happens with us. We walk around with a lot of unfinished business. Now, unfinished yes. business for me means in well how I see it is anything that didn't come to completion. Like we all have hard stuff, which you, which if if uh, if I, someone could say to me, you know, how are you doing about that that incident? I say, you know what, it was really challenging, but I'm feeling okay about it. That's closed. Mm -hmm. But the unfinished yeah. business is it could be careers you didn't take, or men you didn't marry, or this, you know, it could be absolutely anything, or careers you were forced to take. It could be anything, um, or having to live in a certain country, or whatever it is. Um, when we have unfinished business, right, and then someone will ask us, how are you doing about that? And you say, I don't want to talk about it. You know, it's too painful. I put mm. it away and I don't want to talk about it. But what actually happens is it's unfinished. The nervous system hasn't come to completion, right? So it's still there causing us stress and pain behind the scenes. And then when right. the next thing happens on top of that, it just gets exacerbated. And then you wonder yes. why you flip your lid at the smallest thing when your child doesn't, I don't know, flush the chain, you know, or your husband doesn't, you know, pick up his, uh, his laundry. Or, or you, you, you have an encounter that basically reinforces, I don't know, someone that says something that upsets you. It's another chapter in that it book. It triggers. Think, yeah. Yes, it triggers, so, and they're like, "Okay, I'm putting that in the book as well." That's that's more evidence that I've gathered to support my theory that people don't like me. Exactly. So, actually, what what the analogy is is if you were to imagine an onion, right? An onion in a dark cupboard continues growing. It gets roots and shoots, and it mm. continues growing. And that's exactly what happens with these things we stuff away. They want attention. They've come into our life for purpose and reason. And as we said in the beginning. They actually come into our lives to show us who we are, right? To show us what we're made of, to show us what we've got, right? To be able to overcome. And if we don't use that opportunity, it's it's number one, a lost opportunity. But number two, it's a, it gets buried and then things get built on top of it. So it keeps like niggling, wants to come out and wants attention. And then what can happen is then starts talking quietly, little symptom here, Right. A little bit of anxiety there. And what it is, it comes from unfinished business. So the most beautiful thing in that example that you gave on the train is that it was unfinished for years, 30 years it was unfinished. Right? It was sitting there as a pain. And then yeah. the ripple effect was for years, anyone would look at you or say the wrong words. You were like, oh, maybe they don't like me or this, that because of the initial hurt. 
So we go back to that one. And then what we did there was a bit of a correctional experience. We, we got rid of some of the trauma and we gave you what you wish you would have had, right? So um, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of settling the nervous system. We can't actually take the event away and say, just wipe it out. And it, she never said those words, right? We can say um, what we can do because the brain will still remember it, but without so much of the electricity. Once it's changed into this correctional experience, then you have a new experience. And there's like saying, yeah, but I really know that didn't happen. But the truth of the matter is your brain doesn't know it didn't happen because you've just experienced it in your mind. The brain mm -hmm. registers it as, yeah, this did happen. This is good for her. We can keep going back to this new experience. So the next yeah. time you meet someone who maybe doesn't greet you the way you wanted to, you could perhaps then have a new type of thinking. Oh, I wonder what's going on in her life. Not I wonder oh, if she God, doesn't yeah. like Absolutely. me. Absolutely. That's a really good example is that yeah. it's not always about you. Possibly there's something going on. And it happened with a friend recently. We were out and she was really distant. And the old me pre devora would have said she doesn't <laughs> like me anymore. Even though I'd seen her the week before or she said hello to me really nicely. I could see throughout the evening that she was distracted. And and I just said to myself, I bet something's going on. I'm going to message yeah. her when we get back. Yeah. Something was going beautiful. on. It had nothing to do with me. And that's the type of best friend you want, right? When you speak <laughs> yourself in that way. That's how we want it. We want to hang out with people who, who are like that. So it, it starts, as you said, from within. And it was nothing as you thought. And it, let's say she didn't like you when you messaged her. <laughs> you would have known, right? Oh, yeah. There's, I think so. there's this whole thing. Um, actually, it comes from the, the story about the spies, right? One of the problems with the spies is that they said, we felt like grasshoppers and we were grasshoppers in their eyes as well, right? So it's one thing you having low self-esteem and thinking you're small but it's another whole story when you think you know what others are thinking and that's right. what their problem was their problem and the downfall was that they came from that premise that others are thinking this about them and i don't know anyone who is a mind reader and we're not mind readers so we don't know and if we are being kind to ourselves then we'll check it out you know, and then we can save ourselves that dialogue of nastiness and bashing ourselves and what could it mean and, you know, and uh, and then that's a much kinder way of being. Yeah, I think we also had a conversation years ago. See, I remember everything. 2014, I think, I remember we were sitting in the bagel store talking about we were being bombarded by rockets. Uh-huh. I think it was during a break where there weren't any rockets that hour. And we went out for a coffee and, mm -hmm. well, tea. And I was convinced that I, I was going to, that my whole family were going to, like, be attacked by ISIS. That's how bad wow. my consumption of, of news had been. And, you know, the, the, the coming in closer on the border and the whole country is going to be taken over and we're all just going to die. Right. And I couldn't understand how you could be so calm. I was so wound up by the fact that you were so calm, like the world is coming to an end and my family are going to be attacked in their beds. And I was so hysterical. And um, you were talking about how important it is not only to realize that we don't know what is going on in other people's minds, but all that we can control is what goes on in ours. And if right. what I'm doing is spending my time filling it with fear, that's what's right. going to be going on in my head. Right. At which and point I stopped that's... watching news. <laughs> yes, because we also set ourselves up for failure. Obviously, if every time Absolutely. your phone beeps and there's another something, it's going to, every case of coronavirus, if your phone beeps, you're going to be a wreck, right? Yeah. 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 So it, it's about taking responsibility, you know, what we want to see in our lives. We do have a certain amount of control over and um, the, the beautiful idea about the word responsibility is it means our ability to respond. And in mm. that we have control. Mm, you like that? In mm. that we have control, right? And actually, if you like that one, then you'll like this one. Encouragement, the word inside of encouragement is courage. Courage. It comes from that place. 
So our ability to respond to situations is something we do have control of. The whole world was in lockdown now, but everyone felt it differently because Absolutely. how we choose to respond to it is up to us. We can't change the fact that out there there's a virus, but we can change and we can work on, well, how do I show up to this virus, right? Mm. How do I show up to the uncertainty? Um, another thing that I've learned, I studied with a magnificent teacher, Dr. Gerald Epstein, who passed away um, last year. I studied mental imagery with him for just over a year. And one of the things that he was so adamant about is um, anytime someone says the sentence that con contains if and then, it's like stops you right there because that's future talk, right? And when we go down that road of future talk, of imagining what the scenario could be, um, how does that serve us? What are we prophets, you know? Um, right. So so the whole thing is that when we go down that road, why would we choose that one? Um, I, I had um, also, I had a, um, a session with one woman who, she was a single mother and for many, many years, she devoted her life to her children, which meant there were never men, there were no dates, there was just devoting her life to her children. Now is coming this time where her children are starting to leave home and she's feeling totally deserted. I've given my life for these children. I've even put my own life on hold. And um, she could just see this future of loneliness. And I said to her, like, why would you pick that as the option right. of what your what? future is going to be? How I said, funny. because it, it could question. be. I said to her, like, it could be actually that there's a gorgeous man waiting for you in your future. It could be that you think it's so bad that they're moving to Tel Aviv, but really they could be moving to Australia. It could be worse than what you're thinking. Mm. So why, why hang out in that place of what's going to be in the future? It just brings us pain because we choose the one thing which is going to scare us, which provokes anxiety. Why, why would you go there? So as, soon as, future, as soon as future talk comes up, I end it with people like we don't go down that path because we're not prophets. So right. if we were prophets, then we'd be buying lottery tickets and we'd be doing quite well. So, so um, we make our choices based on the best case scenario. And then let's say it doesn't happen. What a lot of us would do is say, see, I thought positive and it didn't work. Mm. So we're wrong. So right. look what that got me. So how would I respond to that? Mm. It's a new opportunity. It didn't work out. So what now? Yeah. What doors are open now that that didn't work out? And if mm. you ask, see, it didn't work and we won like that, then it keeps us stuck in the why me. But if you say, yes, I did, I was positive. Well, that's great. How did it feel to be positive? What did you learn about being positive? And how can we use that now to open new doors? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe this angle didn't work, but if we tweak it a bit, maybe this angle's going to work. Right? Yeah, like a kid taking a driving test, you know? Mm -hmm. um, think, think positive. Think positive going into the driving test. Just think, like imagine yourself in the driver's seat after you've passed your test, you know, making that phone call to tell me that you've passed. Mm -hmm. But what if I don't? Right. So you'll take what it if? again. Yeah. yeah, so what if? Yeah. yeah. So how did it help me to think positive? Because you spent that time not being completely miserable. <laughs> yeah. Why, how and the truth is, is the truth is, if the question is, what if I don't? There's another question. Well, what if I do? What if you do? Yeah. yeah. What if you do? Um, yeah. Actually, there's this one um, doctor whose books I've read that they had a huge impact on me. He's very um, holistic and open minded. He believes in imagery and he believes in drawings and dreams and Dr. Bernie Siegel, and and he worked oh, with I've um, books. yeah he works with with um, cancer patients who he has this group called ECAP, um, exceptional cancer patients, and he says instead of asking the question why me, ask the question try me, you know mm -hmm. like this has come my way, and um, let's see how I'm going to show up, and he says when his patients are asking those kind of questions. There's a lot more healing that comes. Um, so, yeah. Well, we, we touched a, a little bit on uh, logotherapy, but if you had to explain it standing on, on one leg, 
Mm. How would you explain it? <laughs> okay. So there are some principles of logotherapy. And the first is, or one of them is that um, it is possible to find meaning anywhere. Okay. Now we have to remember the founder of logotherapy is Dr. Viktor Frankl, who's a survivor of the Holocaust. So if he's making that statement and he's making it from research, it is that um, it's possible. If you want to find meaning, even in a tragedy that you've been through, you'll find it. Okay. And our deepest drive in life is to have meaning. So um, that our lives should be meaningful. He would even speak about how as soon as people would give up hope in the camps, that was it. Mm -hmm. Whereas when, when they could attach to something with hope or um, I'll, I'll starve now, I'll give half my piece of bread away and then I feel good about myself so make sure I'm not so hungry anymore. As soon as they could attach to meaning, then that helped as well. So we have a very strong drive within us to find meaning, right? And if we can help people on that path to finding meaning, then they can deal with um, how they show up to their struggles and their difficulties. I love that. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, um, I think I last read the book in my late teens. Mm -hmm. um, I've recently picked it up to read it again. I think it's time. Yes. And yeah. it's actually awesome to, to read these things from a different perspective and a different yeah. age, you know, a different life space. Um, we, we, we react to it differently or we respond to it differently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I have a few books like that that I've read in my 20s, 30s, 40s. I'll just keep uh -huh. going. <laughs> I find new things. Please, God, I'll keep going. Yeah. So, Tavora, yeah. I'm going to end with a couple mm -hmm. of random questions. Okay. These are, like, my favorite questions to ask. I'm going to pick okay. ones that, like, I think last interview I did was really brutal. I really put her on the spot, so let's be Ooh, nice. Okay. Let's be nice. <laughs> um, what are the most important life lessons that we can teach our kids? Is that not going easy on you? <laughs> no, that's okay. That's, that's okay. okay. The funny thing is that I have, since logotherapy became such a huge um, part of my own life, it's like filtered out into my children and I'm, I'm constantly speaking logotherapy. So even if we watch a movie and I say, look at how he's doing that. Just look at that choice he's making. And they say, mom, like, can't you just watch the movie? Do you have to logo just therapy? Logo. <laughs> So um, I am trying to teach my children that there are questions to ask, different questions, and that nothing, not everything can be taken away from you because you still have choices. Um, and actually, that's a quote from Dr. Viktor Frankl, that everything can be taken away from man, but the last of the human freedoms is the freedom to choose, the freedom to decide, the freedom to have choice. And um, there, there's a, also, there's a beautiful story of this 14-year-old girl who was in the Warsaw Ghetto. She, had, she was an orphan and she was malnourished and she joined the um, underground um, movement, right? She used to go through the sewers and go and get food and medicine and, and uh, ammunition from the other side. And one day she was caught and she was taken to the Nazi headquarters for three days. She was starved and tortured. And um, on the third day, she was brought and thrown into this room. And the first thing she saw were these black boots, right? And then she saw this black bat and like hitting into her hand. And she looked up at these terrifying eyes. And he said to her, do you realize that your life and your death is in my hands? And she stood up and she said to him, you're right. My life and my death is in your hands. But there's nothing you can do to make me tell you what you want to hear. And she refused to tell him and give up the um, the underground movement. And he was so flabbergasted at her chutzpah that he threw her out and, you know, got her deposited back in the ghetto. And she made it out to the end of the war. So, yes, we might be. And, and these are the kind of bedtime stories I tell my children. Yes, <laughs> we might nice. be. Nice. Yes, we might be in that place where everything's so rotten and everything is so terrible but you can still choose how you want to respond to what's going on. And I think if we can, we can do that for our children, then we, we also empower them to, um, 
to make good choices and to know that that if you also make a wrong choice that you can change it if you wake up tomorrow it means you have a second chance at fixing up anything you didn't do right yesterday and this is the message i'm giving my children that okay lonora it didn't go well but you have another chance you can still fix it find meaning a different way so for Beautiful. me everything i pass on to my kids is like a meaning 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 like you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um okay last question is what mm -hmm. are you really bad at mm. i need to know this one huh <laughs> what am i really bad at oh see mine comes to mind so quickly mm. i'm impressed what, you I, think. what are you really bad at give me an example um ironing and sewing ah okay Hmm. You were thinking on a much deeper level, probably. Mm. What am I bad at? <laughs> wow. I need some time to think of that because I don't hang out in that place. Um, I would rather hang out in the, the place uh, of mind. I know. I, I have a, yeah, I have a <laughs> feeling you'd struggle with this. Yeah. So can you sew an iron? Um, I have learned to sew. Um, in fact, my granny, who recently passed away at the age of 102, she taught me how to sew. And um, I used to always give her my um, my mending to do. And she lived with me when she was in her 90s. And she was still doing my mending for me until she sat me down and said, this is a skill you need to know. And you can learn it now. And she nice. taught it to me. And to this day... I am still sewing, and if I put a button on, it's never coming off. Um, I think we can learn anything. I think we can learn Really? Anything. Can, you, if, can if, you sing? Oh, I can sing. I might not be Celine Dion, but can I you can sing. Can you sing in key and harmonize? <laughs> oh, I think I've, I've thought of something. I'm not, I don't have good coordination. So if you don't put me think. in a Zumba class, I'm not so good there. My hands we and feet found, there, found something. I can't teach coordination. If I'm at a, a simcha and I'm dancing, I know all the dances, but I can't yeah. start them. I can watch. Okay, right. I found something. <laughs> I don't beat That's myself up enough. because of it. No, no, no. I own it. I cannot iron yeah. and That's fine. And I don't want to learn how. Not interested. Yeah. Give it to someone else. It's fine. I am yes, really appreciative of it yeah okay so Devara, we're gonna end here but i want to make sure that if people want to hang out with you online they know where to find you okay so where can we find you okay so i'm my, assuming you're mm -hmm. go on my um website is dk my my initials dk wellness.co.il and i also have a youtube channel you can search for me mm. i have a facebook wellness page which is dk wellbeing it's called if you search for that and um you want to call me i'm happy to have a chat if you want me to give my number i'm happy to do that you want it <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do it privately or something okay perfect or, thank um, you my yeah. darling or ask sarah she knows where to get hold of me that is true just around the corner Hey, this Cheers, was my such love. fun. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Lots of love. <laughs> bye. Bye, bye.